This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. This episode of The Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Deputy, rostering and timesheets without the usual chaos. I've always just loved the industry. So many people have reached out to us over COVID and said, you know, you've been fundamental in, you know, my time when I worked here or there or whatever. And it's so amazing, like that connection to your community and they really are our community now. This is The Luminaries on the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Over the last decade, as we've seen our culinary landscape evolve, it's been the elevation of everyday eating that has made the greatest impact. Professionals of influence taking their skills to a broader audience and enhancing the way we eat in our everyday. But what does it take to bring a quality offering to economies of scale? and not only remain viable, but become an integral part of consumers' eating habits too. Jackie Middleton is the head food nerd and co-founder of Earl in Melbourne. Jackie, how are you? Hi, I'm great, Huck. How are you? I'm great. It's good to have you on the show. You've made such an incredible impact on everyday eating in Melbourne over the last decade or so. Where did the idea of um, come about? I feel a bit embarrassed that you say that. I feel like it's such a humble little thing that we've done and I've kind of had an opportunity recently just to sit back and go, geez, we have done something, haven't we? Um, What was, oh, what gave me the inspiration? Um, Simon and I, my husband and business partner, we had always worked in restaurants and I remember I'd been thinking about this and I think being a woman and working in hospitality, they don't kind of co coexist very well with having a family and children and stuff and it's kind of always been in the back of my mind how do I kind of get out of restaurants and get a different job a real job to be able to do all of those things at once and um, I kind of came up with this concept of why people competing on price instead of quality and um, and thinking about it and I kind of proposed it to him one day over a coffee just randomly having coffee before we went off to our restaurant shifts and we kept talking about it and talking about it and then he's like okay let's do it and I guess suddenly we're, we're doing it maybe it was a bit naive but we um we just went all in so yeah tell us about the idea of it in those early days, what what you thought of, is that what resulted in Earl or did it change? Oh, God, no way. I God, I wish I was um, clever enough to have dreamt up the whole thing back then. I don't, I don't give myself that much credit, Huck. Um, uh, what we, we were working in restaurants and we knew like Simon was um, at Rockpool Bar and Grill running the floor and he'd come from Attica before that and I'd worked in these other fancy restaurants And we knew that we couldn't afford to open the type of places that we had worked in. Um, And we were kind of a bit proud, like we didn't want to open a cafe, you know, like we didn't even call it a cafe when it first opened because all of our friends were restaurant friends and we were all a bit snotty to cafes, right? We only ate in them every day, um, stupidly enough. Um, But we... We kind of had this idea we'd have a food that would have a you know a food store. We're calling it a food store, a store, and um, that we could hopefully multiply it and do a few of them, and kind of we'll make it work that way. Um, I think we hadn't kind of got past mentally planning the business further than getting the first one going and then working on it after that, but. Now I understand from business, you've kind of got to have a bigger picture idea from that. So we were very naive. Um, You know, we just kind of went in tackling the market as I saw it. And I guess more I understand about marketing now, I understand you have to tackle the 
the demographic of the customer, like what does that customer want? Who are they? And I think accidentally, just because of the way I'd been consulting prior, we tackled the demographic really well and we identified or well, identified that, you know, our customers were people that were willing to spend a little bit more on lunch and get something better quality than the average, you know, chicken sandwich or whatever that they were getting from the local, you know, made in front of you sandwich joint. Um, and I guess we were dead on money that people were willing to spend an extra few bucks and get something that's great. So something that was ethically reared and made with good bread as opposed to tip top or whatever, that type of thing. So um, the business model is developed a lot since then and even I guess my understanding of business and my personal philosophies around those types of things um so god I wish I could say that 11 years ago when or 12 years ago now when I first dreamt this up that it is as it is now but it's nothing alike and maybe that's just showing that adaptable being adaptable in hospitality is the key thing maybe Take, take us back to those early days. What, what were some of the challenges involved in trying to deliver quality in such an accessible way? What, what sort of mistakes did you make? Uh, I guess the first mistake was actually trying to get customers to come. Um, I remember I remember the early days, Sam and I would take turns in the morning. We'd watch people queuing out the front of Earl. You know, this is like a month in or so, queuing across the road for coffee in their normal kind of place. And we'd take turns sitting in the window having a coffee to try and build confidence that there was people inside our store that was empty, you know, that the coffee must be drinkable if there's someone drinking it. Um, so, you know, we – that was kind of some of the early things, thinking that restaurant people knew how to run a cafe and that we could um, – segue that skill but then we quickly learnt that that customer focus that you know customer interaction so remembering names and remembering coffees and not because you have to because it's your business model but because you actually really like the people and that's intuitively what our backgrounds were like we I can still walk around 500 Burke Street and see people that were walking around the city there when there was actually people in the city um, and remember go, oh, you know, you're a long macchiato, you know. <laughs> um, their name has probably evaporated out of my ear from now, but Simon and Alyssa, our ops manager, probably know. But I still remember these things because they were so critically important to the business. So, um, you know, so customer service was one of the things we got right. But in regards to the business model, like I remember I had to rewrite the breakfast menu and the breakfast concepts of so many times to get it right because what I I wanted to do initially is like no one was interested in it in it you know well tell us about what what you wanted to do and then what what worked <laughs> um I had this crazy idea of doing and I I still reckon it's got legs um <laughs> of doing sandwiches by the piece so you select how many centimeters you want to buy a little bit like how in France you buy bread by the weight like you can buy a, a centimeter measure or a bread um by uh weights like they might make these giant loaves and you buy a half kilo or 200 grams or whatever and I was convinced that people would buy breakfast sandwiches in the same way so the idea was that we'd have say three types like a, a bacony eggy one a veggie focused one and something or other else that might be more seasonal and people would just come in and go oh give me six centimeters of the asparagus one today or give me and I still I want to eat it I'm sure you do too you like sandwiches <laughs> um, but like it just kind of didn't work and I look back now and it was probably a combination of marketing and us just being a bit green and maybe we didn't give it a go for long enough but you know we had we sold our apartment to open the first Earl so we had kind of limited finances to kind of keep it going so we had to kind of sell some stuff so then we couldn't kind of let me keep faffing around with concepts for months on end we had to adapt more to what people wanted to buy I think that's one of the tricky things in hospitality you have to end up professionally compromising to get customers and then you look back after a while and go is that what I wanted to do really and tell us about when you landed on the food product that you believed in and worked is it is there anything that's survived on the menu from from that moment it's <laughs> so much actually funny enough I'm um, actually because we, we've had a bit of a bit of time up our sleeves and a bit of a renaissance with you know a 10 year and 11 year birthday and so I've gone back through some old menus and first of all I don't put the prices up enough which I need to just call out every hospitality person listening put your prices up more because we're still virtually selling things at the same price as we did in 2010 um 
but pork belly sandwich is still there. That was in the exact same format in regards to the way we cook the pork and things like that. I've tweaked the coleslaw recipe, but it's the only thing that's changed. Um, so that's still there. And I remember us, Simon and I, having conversations maybe this time 12 years ago. It would have been, you know, November, September, October, November, when Simon finished his last employed shift on New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve or something like that um, before we opened in April. And he wanted it to change to pork, pulled pork because it was kind of cool. At the time I'm like, no, 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 it has to be pork belly. It has to be pork belly for all these reasons and it's still there today. And it's still, honestly, our biggest seller as a single product in in a food product. So, you know, the pork's still there. Um, You know, obviously there's always going to be a, a, a chicken, a core chicken product, and that's changed a few times. But kind of the foundations of the menu, I think I was, I just kind of got right at the beginning and then we've kind of ex- expanded that over the years to make it more accessible and it's obviously a very different market 11 years on. Do you remember the moment when you realised that you'd created the right model to be able to expand and, and open a new store. Were you were you ready for this for the second store at that time? Oh, we were ready and hungry. We'd actually um, we'd spent from about the four or five months one after we started getting a shitload of press and it kind of got really crazy. Like we had queues out the door and down the street. Like and I was I was embarrassed by it and we kind of were realizing very quickly that something like that can only has a, a short window of opportunity so you have to kind of make hay while the sun shines and I remember and we we had lots of different people saying to us oh you should do another one you should do another one and a kind of a friend said you know I can put you in contact with someone that can help you grow your business and we spent 18 months talking with this guy um, for him to come in as a business partner and help us open up to 10 stores in five years and it kind of the 11th and a half hour the deal fell over um and Zach was like just born and I remember and I remember being so upset about it because I felt like we invested so much energy into this um Zach had just been born and Simon saying don't worry we're going to do it ourselves we're going to do it and Simon just suddenly made it happen and we essentially you know the jargon that the that they use now like bootstrapping it we essentially just saved the money you know we lived simply and saved up so we could pay to build the next site we never we actually own all of the sites that we've ever had it's only Simon and I just because we've reinvested that money back into the business um so you know we just backed ourselves that we could do the second one and once we got the second and then the third one going then they kind of all starts rumbling enough to kind of feed into itself to do more but I still don't own a house so hey (laughs) How did the, the operations and your roles change as as the the sites sort of were added on? Yeah, um, I went. I initially was, you know, the the mains. We had th- key roles in the kitchen. We had like the sandwich maker. We had the person that kind of did the backup sandwich. So my assistant, and we had someone doing dishes. Um, so that was the three main roles in the kitchen. I was the main sandwich maker. So that moved that developed um Simon was a main coffee guy you know so and so obviously that developed so we eventually trained people to do the roles that we were doing as we got busier and then they train then we trained them into being you know managers and supervisors Simon will be the first to tell you that he washed more dishes in the first year at um, Earl 500 Burke than anyone else did there because we wanted we were aware that we wanted our customers not to identify our faces as being the people that run the business. We wanted our team to be the face of the business. So we, Simon and I had both worked in businesses that had very high profile owners and those people could never walk out of those businesses because people would come in and say, oh, hey, where's Richard or hey, where's whatever, this person that you know is not there and then they suddenly think that the quality of what they're going to get is dimin- diminished. It's a little bit like, a, I think, like a celebrity chef thing, you know, if, you know, is that person not in the kitchen tonight? Oh, it must they must it mustn't be good. Um, so we didn't want that to happen, um, and so we kind of took backseat roles and kind of employed people into more f- customer facing roles. So when we did grow the business, people wouldn't notice that Jackie and Simon were missing, that they were going and opening a new place, you know. Um, so 
we, you know, we've done so much and to get to where we are now, you know, I, I run, I guess I say I run the creatives of Earl. So I, I may be the head food nerd, as we say, you know, I do the, the food development um, and the recipes and all that type of stuff. And all the food questions come to me and all the, the staff um, development in regards to our seniors for that comes to me. But I also do the store design just because I feel like I have an eye for it and it's kind of ended up being in something that's fallen into my group of work I also do all of the the marketing and run kind of the business strategy of that where Simon's diversified into business growth and general management and um, HR and um, that type of administration type general management role so um, it's very different to making coffee and making a sandwich I tell you as as you were developing and growing uh, the company and altering your roles What's the best business advice that you received during that time? <laughs> um, be careful working with your husband <laughs> um, if you want to stay married. Um, so we did stay married. Um, so that was probably good advice. Um, but I, I really do think that is strong advice. Like be careful that the people around you, you people that you enjoy working with, um, you know, so – we, I think we're being really fortunate. We've got people that have worked with us for a really long time and I think maybe because we're nice people and we're a bit no BS about the way we do business, like we're not kind of a cashy business. We kind of, it's really a legitimate job when you work for us um, and we legitimately care about our team. Um, best business advice, maybe it's advice I gave myself, make sure you pay your bills. Um I've, I've always felt really anxious when I worked in other people's businesses when I knew that they weren't paying bills because I'd get all the calls coming in through the days saying, oh, can I speak to so-and-so about the account? I never wanted that to be my business. I wanted to be really proud. I think that's done us well um, going to COVID as well because we were we had a really strong eye for our numbers and an eye for, and our business was sitting, you know, really buoyantly before COVID struck. So that kind of has seen us through to the other side because we've, been acutely aware of that other people might have been trading in a way that they could keep trading you know week to week month to month but when you're running long lead accounts with um, lots of suppliers we suddenly you have no income coming in which is what happened to us it's really hard to keep paying your bills so um yeah liking who you work with and also liking and keeping a tight eye on your finances um is I think has been really important to us. Like I know how much every item costs down to the cent in, in a store. Like it's really intuitive. Um, and I can also tell you the height of all the bars in the store now as well. But um, it's, like, it's a weird skill set you learn as a small business operator. This episode of The Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Deputy, helping managers and staff do their best work. Building a business is hard. I feel it as I build my business. But I can tell you one thing, that every single day, I feel very blessed for the impact our business deputy has in this hospitality community and the numerous stories that we have been part of. Stories where I've heard deputy customers who have opened new restaurants because of the cost savings they have had by implementing deputy in their business. Being able to open new restaurant, creating new employment, new opportunities, and new connections. For more information, go to deputy.com. Why do you think that people love Earl so much? You've, you've got the side, the business side that you guys look after, but on the consumer side, they're just going somewhere to eat. But what is it about Earl that is, has become so popular? Um question i i think we have been clever in the way that we've placed our stores in that if they if you kind of like something if you have a connection with a brand or a product or something like that if you're if you can see it in multiple places there's a um a familiarity or you know it's kind of like if you're overseas and you want to find a clean toilet you might try and find a Macca's right if you're kind of a corporate person in Melbourne and you've you know you're loyal to the Collins Place store and you know Wendy the barista there 
if you're at the other end of the city and you see an Earl sign, you might go, oh, okay, cool. I can get a coffee there and I trust it. Like, because Melbourneans are fussy about their coffee. So you might go, okay, I trust that place. I might not know where there's other cafes around here that I would trust, but I trust that brand. So I'd go there. And I definitely have seen that as being a connection with our business in that people know our brand and we know that we're sticklers for consistency so that they can trust us. Um, so, And that's something that I'm particularly proud of because I would hate to think that people think one site is better than another site. Um, you know, I've had people make comment on Urban Spoon or whatever when that was a thing saying, oh, you know, the, the franchise at Emporium is not as good as the other sites. And I'd be like quick to jump in and go, no, nah, it's not a franchise, mate. <laughs> They're all the same. <laughs> How much has the hospitality changed in the time that you've had Earl and, and the way that you run the business as well? Um, a lot, actually. Um, you know, I think maybe the cloud and the benefit of some of those kind of hospitality things. I remember Simon used to be a smellier, so we started off running our accounts for Excel spreadsheets, God forbid. You know, now there's the things, you know, all this cloud accounting and computing and stuff that makes your life easier, especially when you're a multi-site operator like we do. You know, I remember we um, we didn't even have interfaced EFT, like we had minimums for EFT charges. You know, this was pre-TAP as well and all this type of stuff. So, you know, by people buying lunch on their credit card was a rarity and there was virtually no FPOS for someone buying their lunch or their coffee or anything. You know, we're, we've reopened some sites um, post-COVID with no cash. Um, we used to be running and getting cash twice a day from the bank to get coins and things like that. Now it's kind of inversed. Um, There's hardly any cash at all. Um, as an operational thing, that's really significant. It makes things really um, streamlined and clean to operate and and simple like that, but also we're paying the banks more for the privilege of, you know, the bank fees and all these extra um, commissions and things. So, you know, I guess there's some wins and, loss and losses. You know, there might be productivity increases, but there might also be losses. Like we use a, a program for our catering orders and for years we operated via email and, you know, it's just it's very labour intensive. We layer in a system that seems really expensive per month, but then suddenly you're like you can do it with a quarter of the amount of staff. So it's just it's, a, it's interesting. It's really interesting. But you kind of get so – there's so many things you're paying out for and you think, wow, it's a lot of money, but then how do you trade without it? Your business model is reliant on people – buying coffee, breakfast, lunches, and in in many cases in areas of the CBD where there's a lot of workers and that hasn't been the case in the last year and a half. What sort of impact has that had on what you do? A lot. Um, you know, we're still – being this day, I just saw last week's numbers, you know, we're, we're trading at 10% at the moment of normal – trade you know um and that's with doing a tiny little bit of home delivery and one store trade you know doing a bit of coffee for residents we were doing tradey coffees um and we were kind of doing about 25 percent trade but now there's no construction either so um we're significantly impacted um but it's given us a good opportunity to sit back and um re-look at the business and do things differently and better i'm convinced once we do reopen and we are reopening all sites except for burke street and that's not a covid thing that's a lease thing um we'll be trading much more um with much higher productivity. So we've taken some, our production kitchen has always been a strong support for the stores and that's just a thing that's evolved just out of need and me wanting to streamline processes. So instead of having four sites making meatballs and cooking them, we make them in our production kitchen and then distribute them ourselves or cookie dough and things like that. Um, now we're starting to make our salads finished um, in our production kitchen um, in the late afternoon and evenings and then it goes to the stores fresh every morning. So instead of holding, you know, 100 ingredients to make salads, we now actually just ha holding six salads that are finished in the fridges. Um, so it kind of we're, we're saving on um, – staff um, and also risk in regards to if someone's having a bad day and they make a mistake or over ordering and all those types of logistical type things and make sending the product into the store. So the customer still gets the same outcome if actually I think it's better because the consistency is better. Um, 
yet and we'll probably have some savings because we're you know we're being smarter about it with vaccination rates going higher we're we're slowly moving towards a light at the end of the tunnel and everything will open up again um what's what's some of the challenges in reopening for an operation like yours the challenges in reopening will be um dealing with it being quiet when we do reopen and there has been some advantages that we've built into the business like I just mentioned but it still is going to be that especially being CBD solely based that we people will be reluctant to come back to office some people are going to be working from home um, we'll probably only be trading strongly Tuesdays Wednesdays and Thursdays as we were back in um, April and May when it was a bit busier um so the challenge will be managing staff coming back to work and paying them at full whack to stand around and be bored effectively some of the time. Um, when we were doing this last time, we had JobKeeper, so the kind of the government was staying, paying them to be bored, where now I'm paying them to be bored. So um, when you don't have a lot of backup cash in the bank, that's a challenge to manage that and also to obviously to keep your staff because we, we've trained them and we we – they're part of our team. We don't want them to go and work somewhere else at the local, you know, their local suburban cafe that is getting pumped because everyone's still working from home. So it's kind of a really careful balance of keeping people employed um, and happy and keeping our books balanced by not having enough customers until people start coming back to the office and us understanding how customer flows will be different again. Even with the changes in structure and, and the hit that you've taken uh, in turnover, the, the brand is expanding and there's some new things on the horizon. Can you, can you tell us about those? Mm, there is. Um, so we have a, a new Earl that we're opening in Richmond and that was actually meant to be opening the 1st of December, but I just found out a couple of weeks ago that because of the construction closed down, that that's now being pushed to March. Um, so that will be our first non-inner city or non-CBD kind of based store. Um, and this is kind of us doing a kiosk as well. So it's a little bit different, kind of treading, testing the water um, for that. We also have Earl at the airport, which will eventually be opening. We've been talking about it for years. Um, it was first appointed in 2019. So um, that actually is going to open in December. So we're starting construction on that really soon, as soon as tradies are allowed back on site. I think they're doing some setup works. So that's really exciting. Um, so that's two Earl projects. And Simon and I have another little COVID silvered lining, which is really fun. We were, um, it's funny the things that happened during um, last year. We got contacted by one of our favorite landlords and saying, you know, there's this site and someone else is not doing it anymore. Would you consider having a look at it? And this was like April when we were still all kind of treading water and working out what's what's happening. And Simon called me and said, I've just had this interesting conversation. What do you think? And I was like, hell no, no way. Don't even talk to them. We're not going to look at it. Are you stupid? I'm like, who's paying for it? And we started looking at this site and it's an amazing location and we ended up just kind of kept working on it and um, it's going to happen. So she's called Dame actually. So we're playing still to the idea of the peerage um, system, which has kind of incidentally fallen upon us. I'm a Republican, so um, I, I, there's no connection there. Um, but we kind of liked the name and the connection. But essentially we're doing a... Um, I need you to probably help me with a, a quite or the right languaging for this, but it's kind of an elated cafe slash restaurant slash wine bar. Um, and But it's mostly a day focus with some early evening trading and it's at 35 Collins Street at the entry. So you can be able to sit and have a glass of wine or a cocktail out looking onto the top of Collins Street. It's really fabulous and it's so beautiful. It's been designed by Bergman & Co. So Wendy Bergman that's on lots of other amazing hospitality businesses recently like Chancery Lane and Poodle and all these really cool things. And she's designed Dame for us and Dame's stunning. Um, you know, she has commissioned artwork and fabulous curtains and specialty furniture and all these great things. So that's been a little COVID silver lining for us and that will be opening in January. How has it felt given the last year and a half and the, the damage that uh, your business has taken and your staff to have something uh, so exciting to work on? It feels like an absolute privilege, I have to say. Um, I And creatively, I think, personally, I feel like I'm 
very lucky that I've had a creative output to work on because I think I may have really mm. been a bit more worried about life in general if I didn't have something other to keep my mind off it. Um, I feel that um, I'm really looking forward to getting it open next year because I actually think Melbourne's going to be really exciting next, next year. I'm really convinced of it, you know, um, and I think we're going to be really well placed to, to do this and have something new and fresh. Um, and I want to do – it's fun to do something different for Simon and I too. So it's going to be an extra um, – string in our bow but something that's kind of nod back to what we used to do in regards to restaurants too so you mentioned that uh, you think there'll be a boom and a really amazing time in melbourne when it does open up it's been a, a, a time of adversity but what's the positives to come from this for the industry and what sort of advice do you have for those in the industry the positives for the industry i think um you know, look, there's lots of police signs up in the city and I, I might just mostly just talk about the CBD because that's what I feel like I know intuitively. Um, there's lots of police signs up and they're probably, you know, the businesses that were probably struggling before. Um, so now there's probably an opportunity for good operators to come in and do things better and the ones that have survived will have survived because they are already doing things better. I don't think there's many businesses that are going to sit out 18 months and open and still keep doing a bad product. So customers will benefit for that. Um, the industry will benefit for that because we will have a better, I guess, standard. Um, I am concerned for industry because of staffing shortages. When we started to get busy again back in April and May, it's just really hard to employ and that's mostly because there's no visa workers um, coming into the country that are experienced, but there's also a lot of people have been scared out of my industry because it's just why do you want to keep working in hospitality when it's not, you know, it's a challenging space to work in anyway and then suddenly you don't have job security um, where you can go and get another job elsewhere and have job security. Um, so there's a lot of people have moved out of the industry. So, um, but there's lots of good things there. I'm, I'm excited because I think that hospitality will come back and, you know, I ate out through, you know, May, April, May, June, and it's clunky again around in the industry, but I think it's a good chance for us all to kind of pull our socks up and, and, do it well again. I feel really optimistic. I really do. <laughs> what, what do you see the next couple of years looking like for Earl and hospitality in general? Um, Earl is going to keep trucking on with sites and I feel like we've, Simon and I have always kind of put a benchmark that, well, not a benchmark, but we've kind of valued our level of success by the number of sites we had and I think it's, COVID's made us more realistic that, you know, the productivity and the profitability of those sites is probably more important. So the quality over quantity, and that's maybe a COVID lesson as well for everyone, that it's quality over quantity. Like we don't need a cafe under every bloody new development. We actually just need a couple of really good cafes. Um, same goes for restaurants and bars and all those types of things as well. Um, I think the quality aspect is the thing that's the big win from, from COVID, the big change, is that things will be valuable again, but they'll be better. There can't be that many people that have been to Melbourne or live in Melbourne that haven't experienced your your offering that's influenced so many people's lives over such a long period of time. Well, what is it that you're most proud of? Mm -hmm. um, probably it's longevity. Um, longevity and consistency. I, I really do feel... Like I, I run our own socials. Most of them, most of the posts are from me or um, our, our head office manager Nicole. And I look at the pictures when people tag pictures of our photos or our things, and I'll be the one that's screenshotting that and sending it to the store, going, "How come the garnish on that's a bit off? Or what's going on with that?" And they're like, "Oh, it's a special order. So and so always orders it like that." I'm like, "Great, thumbs up, like that answer." Um, you know, that consistency and um, attention to detail is really important to the business. I don't know if I could. Let let that go um 
that's something that I'm really proud of. And the fact that after 11 years and now COVID, which is easily marks us 30 year old company, um, that we're still around. <laughs> Well, uh, the the day where the doors open again and we start moving forward beyond COVID, they're not far away. Um, how's it going to feel once you get um, a business back back on the wheels? It's it's going to be great. I um, yeah, I actually look back to where it was in May and I felt really buoyant for quite a few months, for quite a few weeks there because it was really busy and kind of felt really old school. Um, yeah, I think it's going to feel great and I am really enthusiastic about it. I, we're kind of going into a, quite a segment of change with new sites and, you know, the airport site is in partnership with Delaware North, so that's kind of a different hat we're wearing. Um, Richmond is going to be a little bit different again as well. So we're going to be really relying on our team to keep running the city stores as you know, as well as I already do, and just keep doing what they do really well. And so Simon and I can really focus on some of the new things coming up. So um, that's going to be a really fun part of something I'm looking forward to for next year. So wearing a few different hats in different ways. What is it that you love about what you do? Mm. Um, I've never done anything else. So, um, and I think it's one of these. I'm one of these hospitality people that fell into it and kind of never managed to get out of it. And when I did go and have an office job for a little while when I was working as a menu designer, I, I really missed kind of that buzz of service and stuff and so much so that I actually would just go in and do service at a friend's restaurant because they'd ring me up desperate for a waiter and like, come in and help. You know, I remember Simon working at Attica going, so-and-so is calling sick, I need you to come in and run the private room tonight. And I'm like, I've already done my nine hours, but I'll come in and do, you know, another rock star shift for you as well. Um, I've always just loved the industry um, and that buzz you get from, you know, a customer, you know, a, a guest, someone that you know, like, you know, we've even had so many people have reached out to us over COVID and said, you know, you've been fundamental in, you know, my time when I worked here or there or whatever. And it's so amazing, like that connection to your community and they really are our community now. I I, I don't know. I, I'm one of these founders. I don't know if I could sell my baby um, if, if that was ever a thing one day. Not that anyone's going to buy a hospitality group, are they, now? But, um, you know, I'm really proud of what we've built and I enjoy that buzz of the way it works. So I, I'm, I'm rambling now. But that was, you know, that's kind of the buzz of it. Yeah, the buzz of hospitality. It's, it's addictive. Well, Jackie, your dedication and your influence is really bloody inspiring and we're absolutely honoured to have you on the luminaries on Deep in the Weeds today. Please keep in touch and um, good luck and we'll catch up again soon. Thank you. I'm very humbled to be included. Thanks. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.